just or Auburn hooks it. It's the Progress Report, as it is every Wednesday uh, for many years now. And uh, so it's the first Wednesday of the month, which it is. This is Wednesday, the first Wednesday in March. I'm always pleased to be joined by my good friend for many, many years, yeah. the distinguished senator and dean of the Senate, Lou D'Alessandro. Thank you, Robert. And right next to him, we have our... Uh, he's, this guy, Don Kreese, is an able lawyer. He also happens to be the New Hampshire consumer advocate. And in a recent piece he wrote, he described himself as an obscure <laughs> state bureaucrat, which I hope is not true, but we hope to <laughs> fix that right now because he is an awesome presence in our state. I, I was just trying to explain that I'm not entitled to a COVID-19 vaccine before frontline health workers. That, <laughs> that's what I meant by obscure. All I oh, want to make well, sure well. is I'm ahead of you because you're <laughs> a goddamn lot younger than I am. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm waiting for March 31st. I can't believe it. Oh, well, we're doing, we're doing March 12th. We got our first one. Well, you're even older than I am, so I, I, am, I, I am. can accept that. Oh, thank you so much. Not by much, but a little bit. <laughs> uh, my daughter got her vaccine today, so I'm happy about that. That she has a serious health condition, oh, well, and well, I'm great. a happy dad. That's yeah, great. you're a proud dad, too. Right. I, I yeah, enjoy sure. seeing your posts about your pride in your daughter, which is wonderful. And we have via Skype Madeline Minot, uh, formerly uh, head of uh, you know uh, energy planning for the city of Nashua. And now she's taken over what used to be the New Hampshire Sustainable Energy Association and turned it into Clean Energy New Hampshire which she has raised uh, way up to a major status as an advocacy organization advocating for good energy policies for New Hampshire. So, you know, energy's been an issue in this, uh, in this state forever, hasn't it? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, right. I started on the Seabrook case right. a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. A long time ago. Sure. And how things have changed. And some things have not changed at all. But energy's still a very key part of our future. Now we have new issues that we never had when we're thinking about Seabrook, like we have to save the climate and, uh, you oh, know, we do. the energy sector is a major contributor to uh, carbon emitting gases, which are, uh, you know, threatening life as we know it, civilization as we know it. Um, and energy is always important on economics uh, at every level from the state budget to, you know, individual consumers' pocketbooks. And so we, we could not be more, more pleased to have uh, these fine experts uh, uh, with us to talk about uh, our energy policy. And you know, guys, I'd, li I'd like to start with this, you know, and I know you both agree with me on this, but you know, I've told this story, you both have heard it, but when I was fighting the Seabrook Dragon, which at one time was supposed to involve two reactors, and I got one, folks, remember that? Right. We stopped one. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the line was, hey, energy demand is going up like this. It has to go up like this or the economy will go like this. So they got to go up together. Energy demand, economic activity go up together. And the only way to meet that demand is if you don't like nuclear, you can get coal. Okay, not a great choice, right? It turns out we had better choices and now we know what they are. And yet New Hampshire, alas, is lagging so far behind our other states in the region, our other, uh, you know, friends and sometimes competitors, the other six, uh, five states in the New England region, that we're not doing well on this. So let me uh, ask either of you, uh, why is this and how do we get this way and how do we get past it? Well, I happen to think that the cheapest and best thing to do to meet the next unit of demand for energy is energy efficiency. Uh, the megawatt is always going to be cheaper than the megawatt. And Bob, as you just mentioned, we are, uh, we are lagging behind. We are, in fact, dead last, not only in New England, but in all of the Northeast until you, until you get to Delaware on energy efficiency. And uh, as my friend Madeline Minot knows, because her signature is on there, same as mine, uh, we had a great agreement on a three-year energy efficiency plan that was supposed to go into effect on January 1st. We were going to save 4.5% of electric sales over the next three years, 2.8% of natural ga gas sales over the next three years. Every party that went before the PUC said, great, let's do this. We submitted it to the PUC, and the PUC has refused to act so far. And I would like to compliment you, Don, and perhaps all you so, man, Th to get that agreement. And by the way, at the PUC, if you don't come to agreement, you go to litigation before the Public Utility <laughs> Commission. 
And that's something we should all hope to avoid because it's expensive, it's uh, time consuming, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's much better to come to an agreement. All lawyers know that if you can come to an agreement through mediation or other, you know, non-litigation techniques, that's the way to go. And here you here you had a, a bunch of people who might be considered to be likely to be very adversary, like the utilities, uh, business organizations, consumer groups, environmental groups. You, Don, got them all to agree on this next edition of the Energy Efficiency Resource Standard, our major vehicle for attaining energy efficiency gains. And so, how come it didn't work? Well, first of all, let me say, I had a lot of help. I mean, you know, your other guest, Ms. Minot, She's she great. She's did great. Yeah, awesomely. Yeah, I, I mean, you don't want to negotiate against her. All, everyone in the docket agreed, except for the staff of the Public Utilities Commission itself. So unfortunately, it wasn't a complete settlement. We still, we had still to have litigate. to litigate most of the issues because the staff of the commission did not agree with us. Well, that's really, I, I guess I can't say I'm surprised because I know what's been going on there, but it is really disappointing that the staff, the electric division of the elect of the Public Utilities Commission was not on board with this. I mean, that, that just, I mean, time for some retirements, I think, folks. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the most frustrating thing is that we still don't have a decision from the commission. I, I didn't hear um, that. Can you repeat that? The most frustrating thing is that we still don't have a decision from the commission on on what the future of our energy efficiency programs are going to be. We're in this really awkward limbo where we're just waiting and waiting for them to make a decision. Yeah. So what's the problem? Why no decision on this? You got agreement of most of the parties, although apparently some some problems, as Madeline says, with the PUC staff, which is I think quite distressing, but what is the problem? We, we know we have, you know, the, the Public Utility Commission is usually made up of three members, one of whom is to be a lawyer. They're all, you know, through the governor and council. And uh, now we are, we have a vacancy. It's been there for quite a while. And we have a new chairman, Diane Martin, who came from the attorney general's office. And we have a commissioner, Kathleen Bailey, who's a, who's a term is uh, coming up pretty soon, I think. Yeah, I believe uh, this, uh, this coming summer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, 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 why, why, is, why is this not going forward? And this is the number one vehicle we have to advance energy efficiency. Well, you know, it probably doesn't serve my interest to speculate about what I think is going, inside, uh, going on inside the PUC. But I can tell you outside the PUC, there are some very fervent opponents of ratepayer funded energy efficiency in uh, the legislature and they have written to the PUC and asked the PUC to do exactly what the PUC has done so far, which is to say nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, th I think the PUC is under a lot of pressure right now, uh, political pressure. Well, I kind of elaborate on, on that pol political pressure from the outside sources. How, I mean, how, how are they exercising their juice in order to make this happen? Uh, well, there were uh, dueling letters from uh, two halves of the Science, Tech, and Energy Committee, the uh, body that uh, former Representative Backett used, Backus used to chair. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get partisan, but the fact is that there's a different party that holds the majority now than held the majority when uh, Representative Backus wielded the gavel. And uh, it turns out that elections matter. Elections do matter. They I can, certainly I do. I can tell you that without, without a moment's hesitation. So if, it, if it's a political battle, they're, they're, uh, in most situations, there's no winner here. There's no winner unless you change the composition of the committee or the composition of the legislature. Well, I, I think it's even worse than that, Lou. If there's yeah. a political battle, it's a, it's a, it's a stalemate. Sure. Nothing gets done. You and know? the people and the people Nothing lose. gets done. I mean, Don and Madeline put together this coalition of people who might have very diverse interests. They came together on this. Right. And yet... Uh, the the political people moved in, and uh, as Don said, there was a, a letter signed by 11 prominent Republicans. Let's be honest, that it was the Republicans asking the PUC not to rule on this, claiming that the pandemic uh, mean, meant that we should not move forward with any additional funding for energy efficiency. You know, that is dead bang wrong, Bob. 
I mean, the point is, the point of energy efficiency is economic stimulus, right? right. I mean, it's local Among jobs. Among other things, but that's it's a priority. Reta it's yeah. retaining wealth, yeah. and it is helping people spend less on energy so that they can get more work done per unit of energy. That is all wealth-building stuff, exactly the kind of thing we need to lean into as we're trying to rebuild the state's economy as we crawl our way out of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, for us, it's all about, you know, keeping our energy dollars local, lowering people's energy burdens, and energy burden is how much of your income you have to spend on your energy bills, and making people more comfortable in their own homes and businesses, and lowering your cost to operate either your home or your business. There's actually a lot of demand for our energy efficiency programs right now. People are spending a lot of time at home, they're working from oh, home, they're feeling stuck at home, and they're saying, hey, um, you know, I'm spending a lot more on, on heating oil or natural gas to heat my house. And hey, my house is kind of drafty when it's really cold outside. Wouldn't it be nice to maybe put a little bit more insulation in the walls or in the attic? And so we're actually seeing a lot of demand for these programs right now. Yep. Sure. Uh, Brendan, I don't know if you know, I'm getting an echo when Madeline's speaking. I don't know if there's anything you can do about that, but if there is, you know, whisper to my ear. <laughs> I, hope, I hope that. The, uh, watching uh, the viewers out there are not hearing that, but I, I'm certainly hearing, which makes me kind of hard, hard to understand what you're saying, Madeline. But I think I got most of it. It makes you sound more formidable, like the, <laughs> like the voice of the wizard on the Wizard of Oz, or maybe like I'm in a cave. Right. Yeah, it does. <laughs> now, Madeline, your your organization, Clean Energy New Hampshire, I'm sure you do support energy efficiency as. You know, Don says that's his that's his number one objective is to advance Absolutely. our energy efficiency. But you are interested in advancing renewable energy in New Hampshire, and uh, yes. we're falling behind there too, aren't we? And uh, why is that, and what can be done about it? Um, you know, we have some programs in the state, limited as they may be. Um, we have a renewable portfolio standard, which is a great policy that many states have have adopted. And it's been one of the really successful policies to accelerate the adoption of renewable energy, but also to make sure that our sources of energy are diverse. So when we think about not wanting to put all our eggs in one basket, it's really important when you think about energy planning to have what's called fuel diversity. So we don't want all of our electricity to come from one source because if all of a sudden there's a supply problem in natural gas, if all of our electricity is generated from natural gas plants, that's when there's a risk that the grid could go down. So your supply of energy is much more resilient when it comes from a variety of sources and a variety of generation types. So the renewable portfolio standard is great for both those things. But just like Don said at the legislature right now, we're fighting to just keep the policies we have. There's a bill right now that we're working really hard to oppose that would reduce our renewable energy goals, which are already really tiny compared to the other New England states. Yeah. Our goal is to get to 25% renewable by 2025. The other New England states are looking at 80%, 100% goals. So that's a big difference. Uh. Recently, uh, in one testimony that I had to give, I compared how much solar we have here in New Hampshire compared to our neighboring states. And we have, we're barely um, starting to get close to having 1% of our electricity needs generated from solar energy in state, whereas Massachusetts is over 18% and Vermont is over 14%. Yeah, so yeah, they've sure. been much more aggressive um, on, 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 uh -huh. on encouraging adoption of renewable energy in their states. And as a result, they have really robust um, renewable energy industries. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's very sad to think, uh, you know, a few years ago, I used to enjoy going around and seeing, you know, people from Sunrun and Solar City, uh, you know, see, see signs out on the, on the road, you know, Goffstown, Bedford's going to be a Solar City place. They've all left us. And, uh, you know, we still have great companies like Revision, an employee-owned company. Uh, but, you know, they're not doing anything like the business in New Hampshire that they're doing in our neighboring states. Isn't that right? Certainly. Um, we've seen a loss in solar industry jobs and renewable energy jobs in general in the state. They, they will go and invest and hire people where the policies are more favorable. So there was major policy changes in Maine over the last couple of years. Yep. 
And Maine is currently seeing a renewable energy boom. And even despite the pandemic, they've seen incredible growth in, in jobs in that sector. Yeah, my goodness, my goodness. So how do we turn this thing around? <laughs> I mean, we, we, we can ask you to run for, you know, state senator, or, you know, governor, or, you know, whatever. Uh, well, I, I live in Concord, so you uh, probably don't want me to defeat the people who are already No, you got good me. reps in Concord. We, we agree with that. Right. Uh, well, we can enjoy the fact that we're not Texas. Right. <laughs> Uh, that's, we can do that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good hey, point. by the way, I know I know you write you write great stuff, and I love to read what you write, Don. And I know you wrote a, a column, which I th I'd like you to kind of recap. We all looked at Texas, you know, oh. four million plus out of power, yeah. and nothing was winterized. The governor went on Fox News to claim, "Oh, it was the windmills." <laughs> <laughs> it was the windmill. And, and the Green New Deal. <laughs> and the Green New uh, Deal. Yeah, yeah. I, no. I, I, I write a column on indefnh.org, and I, I, I wrote about Texas because I was on the exchange about a week ago, and we were talking about community power aggregation, and people called in. I'm sure we'll get calls about this tonight. All people wanted to do was talk about Texas. Yeah. Well, you know, mm. Valentine's Day was very bad in Texas, right? I mean, it got wicked cold in Texas that night yeah. in the middle of the night, and demand soared to a record level, about 70,000 megawatts. That is a lot of power. And 30,000 megawatts of power just tripped right offline because the plants there were not winterized. They were not set up to uh, um, basically stay online when the weather got that cold. And so what happened in Texas is that they simply failed to uh, impose requirements on their generation sector to be available to generate when the weather got extreme and and for good or ill I don't, I don't think that the same thing would happen here in New England we have other vulnerabilities that we need to think about mm -hmm. and we're going to get to those but let's mm -hmm. see if we've got a call here hello caller we're glad you're joining us on the progress report uh, please go ahead right with your question or comment yes, hello uh, good evening uh, I got a question the um, my father worked for public service for many many moons yeah and he, he, he keeps telling me that um, the reason why we got one of the highest electricity rates in the nation is because we haven't built any any new power plants, and the ones that we have that are they are out there now cost a lot of money to upkeep because they're so old. Yeah. So, so, what do you think uh, about that statement? Okay. Who wants to go first? I'm, I'll hang up and listen. I'd well, like to answer the call. that. <laughs> Let's let so, Madeline go on this. People don't spend a lot of times looking at their electric bill, but your electric bill is actually broken down into different types of charges. And there's one section that's the actual electricity, and that makes up maybe about half your bill. Yeah, and than then it. there's the distribution charge, which is what the utilities actually do is to deliver your electricity. And so that's the poles, wires, substations, transformers that you see around your neighborhood. And then there's a transmission cost. Those are the really big wires and poles that get the, the electricity maybe from Seabrook to other states or to faraway places. And then there's other charges like the charge that funds our energy efficiency programs. And so if it was really a matter of we don't have enough generation and our generation is expensive, it would be that energy or electricity charge that would be high and going up. But that's not the case. Actually, the energy cost has been going down and down and down. Our wholesale electricity prices in New England have been really low um, up until the last month or so when it's gotten up a little bit more. But We've seen two to three cents a kilowatt hour um, in the wholesale market. So there seems the actual electricity generation is pretty cheap. It's the, we have a really outdated grid and it's getting more and more expensive to upgrade the distribution system and the transmission system and to maintain that to get the electricity to you. Yeah. Bob, I see you were doing the same thing I was. I just pulled up my ISO New England app. I was going to talk about that. You could talk about that. Everybody should know about this. Uh, so uh, the governor likes to do this too. You know, ISO New England is our regional transmission organization. So they run the grid for all of New England. They, uh, that, that is where electricity trades at wholesale and they are supposed to keep the power on. So they oversee these markets. And actually, while I was sitting here, the price just went down. It was about $85 a megawatt hour here in New Hampshire a second yeah. ago. And just in the last couple of seconds, it ticked down to uh, a shea under $78. Th those yeah. are actually rather high prices. Yeah, they are. Uh, as Madeline just mentioned, compared to what we've been seeing. I mean, yeah. the, it's, it's usually, uh, you know, in, in times when the weather isn't quite as cold as it is now, 
uh, you know, it's often down in the you know twenty six dollar range. Overnight, it sometimes goes negative, and the grid actually right. pays people to use power. Um, well, and it's so, important to note that we're just past the daily peak. So another really interesting thing when you look at this app from ISO is that power is not um, regular, right? You're not demanding the same amount of electricity all day. The amount that people demand from the electricity grid actually goes up in the morning and then back down during the day, in part because of solar generation, yeah. and then back up in the evening. And so the prices in the wholesale markets go up and down to go along with that demand. Yeah, let's just look at ISO New England for a minute. A lot of people watching the show, maybe they know, maybe they don't. New England is an integrated electrical system and all the power is managed out of an office in West Holyoke, Mass, which is where ISO New England, which stands for Independent System Operator. And uh, they have the task of on a minute by minute basis, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, of matching demo demand for electricity with the sources for electricity, which includes not just generating plants, but it includes, uh, you know, uh, pump storage, storage systems we have. It includes, um, you know, uh, energy efficiency in some important ways. And, uh, and they, they manage this, I mean, it's really quite remarkable. Um, but one of the major difference between New England and Texas, as I understand it, and you folks can tell me if I'm wrong, in Texas they had just this one state, which wasn't the entire state, but almost all of Texas was in just one electrical operator, a grid operator, called ERCOT. And uh, uh, well, that's right. So the difference between, or a key difference between Texas and New England, is Texas hates the federal government, right? They don't want to subject themselves <laughs> to federal well, regulation. Well, they just proved that with the governor declaring an end to the mask yeah, mandate right, right. and any capacity right, limits right, exactly. on businesses. So what Texas did was they isolated themselves electrically. Why did they do that? Because then there's no interstate commerce, and with no interstate commerce, they, then the, the federal government has the feds no. Feds can tell them not not, tell, not right. talk to them at all. Right. Tell them what to do. Mm. And so when uh, the grits hit the pan in Texas on Valentine's Day, there was they had no ability to uh, look to their neighboring regions for help. Yeah. If we need help here in New England, we can get help from New York, from New Brunswick, from Quebec, from the Middle Atlantic states. I mean, we, you know, it's not a good thing when that happens, but there is a kind of a mutual aid yeah. character right. to the whole electricity grid. Well, the other thing that's about, about our system, as I understand it, is somewhat different from Texas, is we have this thing called the forward capacity market, where ISO pays a lot of money to have electric capacity on standby, right? And in Texas, exactly. that yep. was a pretty skinny standby, as I understand. Well, it. so there is no capacity market in they Texas. They don't. Yeah, they don't have a capacity market at all. No in capacity Texas. market at all. Uh, but I, but some there, of us but, think here we pay too uh, much for that capacity. Well, we pay a lot of money for capacity, but the price of uh, wholesale electricity in New England is capped at about two thousand bucks a megawatt hour. The cap in Texas was nine thousand bucks, and that's what they were hitting for not just on mm -hmm. Valentine's Day, but for several days after that, yeah. they were bumping up against that $9,000 uh, limit. Right. And uh, just for clarity, $9,000 means $9 a kilowatt hour. And uh, you know, right now, if you are a default service customer of a utility here in New Hampshire, I think you're paying around six or seven cents per kilowatt hour. So imagine if that price goes up to nine dollars. And and there mm -hmm. were customers in Texas okay. who were exposed to those fluctuations yeah. in the wholesale right. market. Right. Yeah. That was horrible. Bills. I mean, people were getting ten thousand dollar electric bills. Yeah, yeah, saw that. Yeah. That that should yeah. never happen. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> so, Madeline, what is Clean Energy New Hampshire going to do to help us, you know, up our, where, where are we at? In, 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 uh, in the nation, we're ranked number 20 in terms of energy efficiency. Oh, it's not that bad, yeah. Bob. I think we're up to 18 now. Oh, we made it to 18? Yeah, we improved a little bit recently. Right. In part but because of our energy efficiency England, right? research. But, right. Well, so, you mm -hmm. know, it's not fair to compare us to the whole country, right? Because there are places in the country where energy efficiency doesn't matter as much as it matters up here, where yeah. it's cold and right. dark and where we're far, far away from Texas, where all that natural gas is coming right. up out of the wells. Right, right. That's a good point. And in terms of our renewables, I think you've already kind of given statistics about how much we're being beat by our neighbors in Vermont and Massachusetts, and now Maine as well, which used to mm -hmm. be pretty much as retrograde as New Hampshire was. We're being uh, we're just we're just way behind on this, and uh, so 
what 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 is the what what are the key things we need to do to make New Hampshire move up its improve its game? I mean, some of the policy issues we've been working on for a long time is to allow larger energy users to right size their renewable energy projects and investments. So we we have a cap right now on the size of projects that can participate in net metering. Net metering is a really important policy to encourage the adoption of intermittent renewable resources because it allows you to get a credit when you overproduce that you can use when your system is not producing, like at night for solar, or to share your credits with a group of accounts. And that's really important for municipalities, for example. They might want to put a big solar array on a landfill and that supply energy for... Yep. Yeah, Manchester is considering to do that for a group of city buildings and schools. So um, for a long time, we've been wanting to expand the size of those projects that can participate in net metering. Right now, if you your system can generate a single uh, electron over a megawatt, you can't participate in net metering at all. So um, there's a couple of bills that are promising just for municipalities um, this session. I've heard that um, the bill in the House might not be going forward, but there's a similar bill in the Senate I still have hope for. We still think that this would be really significant to encourage um, more adoption of renewable energy. But, um, I mean, ramping up our goals for the state. Like we said, businesses are looking for those policy directions. They want to see that the state has ambition, says, we are welcoming you. We want more locally generated renewable energy here in our state. And right now, our renewable portfolio standard is the only policy that does that. And it's not very ambitious. It's not sending out a big welcome signal, please come invest in our state. So ramping up our goals, having um, greenhouse gas reduction goals in statute. All the other New England states have those. There's nowhere in our laws that says it matters to work towards reducing emissions in our state. And that's an important policy that we think we need to put in place. And there's a study commission proposed in the Senate that would look at just that issue. It's an important um, foundational policy to say, first, we think it matters to tackle our emissions. Then we can have a really detailed discussion about how to achieve that. Yep, yep, well, um... Yeah, it's 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 really alarming. The thing that bothers me more than anything is that uh, what I call the penny wise and pound foolish attitude of some of our legislators, and particularly in the, I'm afraid to say, in the New Hampshire House Committee that I used to chair, Science, Technology, and Energy. There's this feeling that any any small sum, and these are small sums, added to the typical electric bill. First of all, it can be called a tax, and that, that's, that's the ultimate evil. You know, taxes are the ultimate evil. Taxes are theft, some of them say. And, uh, and uh, so we don't want that. The, we think the way to save cons our consumers' money is to make the rates as low as possible. And any increment to fund uh, investment in energy efficiency is in, in antithetical to the goal. But, in fact, it's true, isn't it, that most of the studies I've seen said that, for example, Don, if you invest a dollar in energy efficiency, within a very short time, you're going to get four dollars back. Absolutely. We have a very strict cost-benefit test that we apply to every cent we spend of ratepayer money on energy efficiency. And it is absolutely unassailably true that every cent we spend, every dollar we spend, is going to return more than we spend to ratepayers as a group. So we're not even talking about the benefit that might accrue to you if by virtue of these programs we come along and rewire your house or make it much more energy efficient. We're not even talking about the benefits to you personally. We're talking about the benefits to all ratepayers in New Hampshire who are paying into these uh, into these programs. Yep. Um, and, and you know, to those who think that, uh, so it appears on your electric bill as the system benefits charge. Yes. So people say, well, that's a tax, but I don't understand how you could call it a tax for these reasons. One, 
it is not collected by the government. It's collected by your utility. Two, the money doesn't go to the government. The right. government never gets right. its hands on the money. Three, the government doesn't spend the money. Right. So if the government doesn't collect it, if the government doesn't get it, and if the government doesn't spend it, then how is it possibly a tax? Right. Yeah. Yeah. There have been many attempts to get rid of the system benefit charge. I was in the legislature when we did deregulation. It was an advocate for the system benefit charge. Right. To be mm -hmm. honest with you, I mean, just, I think it's it, it's it's one very important, very very important thing. It, and it, 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 fun, it funds not only energy uh, efficiency; right. it funds low income assistance for yes, the people yes, that have yep. trouble yeah, keeping the electricity on right. in their homes because right. they're strapped. Right. It, it, uh, low income bill assistance, a, exactly. A, if you can't pay your bill, yeah. you can get it you was, can get help that it was way. It's a good piece of legislation. And, and by the way. Uh, I don't, but I don't know if you were in the room that night, Bob, but we did deregulation in, in New Hampshire, but Bilo was in the room. Oh, I was there. I was in the room. We well, were, I was nearby. <laughs> we, were, we, were in the Senate, we were in the Senate president's office when we, when we cut the deal to deregulate. And the, uh, the key guy was the head of, of, of what was then uh, the Connecticut-based utility that, that now is called, called Eversource, and uh, yeah. he made the decision. It, well, it was amazing to me how that how that happened. But uh, could I ask a, a, a question? Uh, uh, what We talk about renewables, and, and there seems to be some confusion about what's, what's a renewable energy source? Because I, uh, there are those who say, well, this is and this is. But defi define and, and uh, lay out for me renewable energy, please. <laughs> sure. So first, I'm going to say there is no magical unicorn perfect electricity generation out there. Everyone argues that whatever it is, there is an impact, right? So even constructing a solar panel does not have zero impact on the environment. So I want to be clear that our organization, I always say, we advocate for the best and the better. And so we are working to move our energy system away from fossil fuels. And we think that it's very important to support local sources of energy that have an economic benefit to our state of New Hampshire. So that's the lens through which we look at it. But renewable is just looking at the fuel source or the generation source and whether or not it is a resource that is renewed by nature. So wind, solar, you know, there's always going to be wind, there's always going to be sunshine and hydro, there's always going to be water flowing in our rivers. Those are absolutely renewable, no question. We also support biomass. Um, our forests regrow. We don't even have to replant trees here in New Hampshire. The trees regrow on their own. So th those are great locally generated renewable resources. When we talk about clean energy, then it depends. Are we talking about what emits um, emissions into the atmosphere or not. So a lot of folks like to advocate for nuclear when they're very concerned about the climate because it does not, you know, emit any carbon dioxide. But that obviously has an environment effect from the mining of the fuel and the storing of the waste and the potential safety risks of having a nuclear power plant nearby. So renewable is, you know, we think of as wind, solar, Hydro and biomass. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had quite a quite a recent history with the biomass industry here in New Hampshire, haven't we? That is that is categorized renewable, but it's it's probably the more controversial of the renewables compared to to wind and solar. I would say there's some controversy about them. And just recently, you know, we've uh, we've ended uh, support for the biomass industry in New Hampshire in significant ways. And I guess right now they're they're really struggling. I don't know how many of them are still up. We had, I think, six wood-fired uh, biomass plants uh, throughout the state of New Hampshire. I think maybe there's, what, one or two still left operating after we uh, failed to provide uh, support for them? Well, the governor vetoed the Yeah, vote. there's six, six small ones and two big ones. And so the two big ones are in Berlin and then Schiller Station in Portsmouth. My understanding is that Schiller is no longer operating its biomass unit. Berlin is still on. Of the six smaller ones, I think there's only one that runs consistently and one or two other ones that will run if the power prices are high yeah. enough to make it economical to run. 
Yeah, that was a major political battle in the last yes. couple of sessions in the uh, legislature. I'm sure Lou was a, was aware of that too. Yes. It was a, because these uh, these plants provide major employment, and right. uh, not just at the plants, but the guys in the, you know, red and black flannel shirts that go out in the woods with their skidders and their chainsaws mm-hmm. or whatever the equipment they use to to harvest this right. timber. Um, so Don, I had this thought. You know, you are by law designated to be the representative. Mm-hmm. Of residential ratepayers to uh, protect their interests, which I think you would probably define mostly, maybe exclusively, I don't know, as their economic interests. I, I hope it's not entirely exclusive, but that's certainly a big component of it. And, and we have these people that are heading the Science and Technology and Energy Committee say, well, if you're really doing that, then you should not be in favor of uh, any additional charges on residential customers' bills for anything like energy efficiency or renewables. And how do you respond? Well, I, I, th- I think that it depends on where you, uh, w- what judgment you make about what to do in the short term that will pay back dividends to people in the long term, right? I mean, it is true that when we spend money on the system benefits charge on energy efficiency, we pay upfront for benefits that we don't get all of right away. Why is that? Well, because we don't let energy efficiency compete with the alternatives to energy efficiency fairly, right? We get all the benefits of the other kinds of energy immediately. We pay for all of those over time, but we pay for energy efficiency measures 100% upfront. We don't amortize those costs, and yet we get bent out of shape when we don't get all the benefits upfront. So, so it's not really fair. We're comparing, it's not that we're it's not that we're comparing apples and oranges. I'm happy to compare megawatts and megawatts, but we're not paying for them the same way. So in that sense, the comparison isn't fair. So you're right, Bob, that I do tend to think of ratepayer interests. I think ratepayers need me to fight to keep their energy costs as low as possible and with as much reliability as I can get for them and with as much flexibility and independence as I can get for them so that they have more choices about the way that they use energy. And I I realize that there are differences of opinion about how aggressively we should invest in renewables and how much we should subsidize them. The, to me, those are all questions for policymakers like Senator D'Alessandro to make, right? Like if we want to subsidize offshore wind or if we want to subsidize the biomass generators, we can do that uh, as long as everybody understands that, you know, the, the ultimately, unless we're talking about taxes, and we never are in New Hampshire, you know, the only wallet in the room is the one that belongs to the ratepayer. That's the only wallet in the room at the end of the day. How true, how true. Um, You've raised an interesting point there, Don. I'd like both of you to talk about We talk about renewables, but the renewable du jour, especially at scale, is looking like it could be the development of offshore wind. I mean, you know, the, the, the numbers they're talking about here are just staggering, but they're, they're not here yet. They're being developed, and they may be floating <laughs> platforms. Uh, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Representative Backus, because now I want to interview you, right? Oh, okay. by gosh. <laughs> here we go. Okay, Uh-oh. Monday morning. <laughs> Uh, the Senate Energy and Environment Committee is hearing Senate Bill 151. And what Senate Bill 151 would do is basically uh, force ratepayers to pay for energy from offshore wind facilities. And so my question for I'm, you is... I'm pretty skittish, skittish about that already. Okay, well, that was going to be my question, because yeah. I know that I you are a, a godfather of I have a slightly different interpretation of that bill. Right, like you don't... Like, to me, restructuring was all about taking the risk of generation investments and moving them off the backs of customers and onto the backs of investors. Which it turned out, I was a little cautious about it. I think it turned out to be really the right thing to have done. Well, right. So then, but, but we have a dilemma now, right? Like, so now the sponsors of Senate Bill 151, and uh, there are Democrats, they're all Democrats, uh, very vigorous proponents of offshore wind and and they should be because we are the saudi arabia of offshore wind <laughs> but, but, but i just take last night <laughs> <laughs> but, but so it the was question a premier becomes, quebec, right, right. Said <laughs> quebec was going to be the saudi arabia of hydro, hydro which it sort of is i guess so but we've reduced our electric utilities to poles and wires operations yeah. right like eversource doesn't own any generation anymore right. Right. but senate bill 151 would say to eversource and the other electric utilities you must enter into contracts to purchase 
offshore wind power. Yeah. And if you don't have anything to do with it, then you can sell it in the wholesale market. And if you lose money, guess who pays? Your customers, 100%. I, 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 that that, well, is, you're, that you're, makes me queasy. You're, 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 you're talking to me, and I'm very interested, but I want to hear what Madeline has to say about that. I was going to say, I have a slightly different interpretation of how a clean energy procurement works. They are not saying Eversource, no matter what the bid is, you will procure that offshore wind power. What a, the goal of a clean energy procurement is, is, hey, put out a request out there and see what the developers are going to propose. If you like their price, if you like their bid, you can sign a contract for it. That's what that bill says. It's not saying you must and you will, no matter what the price is. It says if they come up with a pretty competitive, appealing price, you go ahead and sign that contract. Yeah. Well, you know, it's is, is, is she right? Because I think you were telling me, you know, tell me, tell me, you're saying to me, if you're in favor of having the ratepayers compelled to support this <laughs> technology development. Uh, well, first of all, Madeline is exactly right. That that is exactly right. There is a renewable procurement uh, a, a commission that gets to decide. Like, is this deal good enough to sign? And the bill actually puts me on that commission. I don't want that responsibility because I don't think any of us. I mean, I actually do have a crystal ball. I'm the only person I know who has one. But even though I have a crystal ball that I inherited from my grandmother, a grandfather who was a brilliant man, the fact is that if I make a bad decision next year as part of that commission and I put ratepayers on the hook for 20 years of purchases, then the risk is back on their backs. Yeah. And yes, we're going to make the best smart decisions we can if that bill passes, but we're still basically taking the risk and putting it right back on the backs of the ratepayers. And that's exactly what restructuring was supposed to stop. That is exactly why the legislature acted in 1996. You know, it is just like Gandhi said about uh, Western civilization or supposedly said. You know, they asked him, uh, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, well, gosh, we should try it sometime. <laughs> well, it's the same thing with electric restructuring. <laughs> like, we should really... <laughs> I hadn't heard that one. Uh, Madeline, I like, would we'll, we'll love to weigh in on this. Is he right? I mean, I understand that, yes, it is shifting, that if you do sign that contract, it's shifting the risk over to the ratepayers because they will be on the hook to pay that fixed price for the duration of the contract, which could be 20 years. But from, um, you know, that gentleman that called in said, we need more generation. The way to encourage the development of more generation is to give certainty to the developers and what they're looking for. They will risk their capital. They will invest their money, millions and millions of dollars and hire people and make investments. What they're looking for is that certainty that they will have demand for their product for a certain amount of time with a, a set minimum price. And so that's one way to encourage the development of new renewables. You know, but I thought the very essence of capitalism, you take a risk without any guarantee of uh, success. And uh, Don's saying here, you we you're, you're kind of asked, uh, you know, the customers to guarantee the success. Well, we've been down that road, haven't we? I mean... Uh, uh, several times we've been down that road. <laughs> we've been down that and, road. And by the way, if you let the utility go bankrupt, like public service Too company expensive. did in 1988, it's still bad for rate payers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... <laughs> yeah. The only thing would have been worse if they hadn't gone bankrupt. Let's, let's exactly. not forget that. Yes. Oh, geez, yes. I've always, I've always been amused by the bankruptcy of public service, you know. Uh, I will have to say, you know, as uh, somebody once said to me, his name was Amory Lovins, he said, you know, I, I told them they were going to go bankrupt. I went to their offices and I told them they're going to go bankrupt. And they didn't believe me. And why should they? Because they're selling an essential commodity, electricity, into a captive customer market. How can they go bankrupt? <laughs> and they're on cost plus. And they somehow achieved it. I mean, it's just amazing. Right. And I think one of the great achievements, of, and I, I credit you with this again, Don, as I do in so many things. You know, the goal of uh, the electric restructuring back in the mid-90s which you pointed to, to eliminate the utilities from being, you know, totally, total monopolies from generation to transmission to distribution, all the way they were the monopoly. You had no choice. Right. And we said we can give them a choice as to generation. And, you know, the, uh, the, the, the famous phrase in the uh, preamble to the restructuring statute, the number one reason to do this was to harness the power of competitive markets to lower the costs of, of if energy for customers. You know, I tried to explain that to the New Hampshire Supreme Court, and they did not get it. Well, I can believe that. I mean, you know, and, and you know, and, and that was the number one reason, but it wasn't the number one result. 
the number one result was they did transfer the risk of generation uh, decisions from ratepayers to Wall Street, by and large. Indeed. And, you know, commercial and industrial customers have done very well with restructuring. Very yeah. well. Uh, individual customers, not so well because they have no buying power. Yeah. So that is why I'm excited about community power aggregation. I'm yeah. really excited that the city of Lebanon, the town of Hanover, uh, Keene, Nashua, they're all talking about combining their buying power, creating this joint that's, power that's a very That's a very significant thing. And, you know, Don, I'd like to, you, both of you to talk about that because there's a bill that's been heard by the legislature now, uh, sponsored by the chairman of the committee who succeeded me, uh, to deal with this, uh, th this, uh, this, uh, this issue, uh, 315. And, it's, you know, you looked at it on the surface, you say, sounds all right, you know, but it's not. And maybe you can talk about that. Well, uh, the uh, proponents of community power aggregation have called it the Monopoly Protection Act, and that's what it is. I mean, it's true that the lead sponsor of the bill is the, your successor as chairman, but the author of that bill is, uh, well, I'm not going to mention any names, but their initials are Eversource. And uh, <laughs> they regard community power aggregation as an extinction-level event. They see the asteroid coming in, and they're like the dinosaur, and they're going, oh, well, here well, comes well, the asteroid. I but, but Don, Don, why is that? They're still going to have their monopoly of wires and transmission. I mean, you know, nobody's going to end that monopoly because we're not going to build multiple power lines, you know, to communities. Right, but poles and wires is not, that's not enough toys for these people, right? Like that really <laughs> reduces But it's, it's them. a good steady income with a, with a rate of return, guaranteed. Well, it is. I mean, that, that would be enough for a lot of people, right? That's but, why in the Monopoly board you wanted to buy, you know, utilities. Right. Exactly. They were, they were, they were exactly. always going to make money. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think that if community power aggregation really takes off in robust fashion, like my friend Clifton Bilo is talking about, I think it really does possibly get us to that tipping point where the utility is no longer really in the driver's seat. They're not really controlling how you use energy anymore. They might not even own the meter anymore. Imagine that. You know, yeah, it turns well, out that imagine. meters are not even a natural monopoly. There's really <laughs> no good reason why you must use the utility's meter. Right. Well, imagine if that. some other you company came on along. On a yeah. on a basis. Like, what if they gave you a different meter that was more high tech and that let you do all kinds of crazy things with your energy? Yeah, like, you know, net metering and uh, net metering yeah, I mean, and time of use. We're pushing them on all sorts of fronts. Um, Go ahead. You know, we we overhauled our community power law two years ago to make it really really innovative and there are different models and we like to think of like the very simple 1.0 model and that's what the utilities feel safe with and it's just competitively competitively procuring your electricity like a big commercial industrial customer does but a lot of towns in new hampshire are really excited to have a lot more options and like don was saying maybe put in their own meters maybe create time of use rates for for their part of the bill. Maybe do their own billing or add demand response programs or battery programs or energy efficiency or weatherization programs that they layer on top of the uh, efficient of the utilities programs. And that's what the utilities are really uncomfortable about. I mean, at the commission, we're pushing them more and more. We're in a docket talking about electric vehicle charging rates. And we're saying, why don't you use the metering function in the charger itself to implement a new rate and they're very uncomfortable about that because again that's not their meter that's not stuff that they own but we're saying think outside the box let's get modern let's evolve but that makes them uncomfortable this is just another chapter that started with restructuring right like if you remember the new hampshire public utilities commission approved its restructuring plan in uh on the last day of february 1997 that was a friday uh, following Monday morning, almost exactly, how many years ago was it today? Following Monday morning, they were in federal court getting an injunction. Why? Because they thought restructuring was going to kill them. And it hasn't killed them yet, but it has weakened them. And now they see that maybe they're at the tipping point, or at least Eversource does. It's very interesting. Not all of our utilities have the same opinion about this. At least one of them is into leaning into the, into the future and trying to be something like a company of the future uh, because they realize that just like we're not using the whale oil companies anymore uh, for our energy, that if you don't adapt to technological change, you're going to die. You know, yeah. where is the New Bedford and Nantucket whale oil monopoly these days? Nowhere. They're not selling you electricity. Well, if Eversource wants to be selling you whatever you're going to be buying in the next century, they have to adapt. But they don't want to adapt. Their executives 
want to just collect their bonuses and retire yeah. and get the heck out before the asteroid really does come in. Well, that's so so interesting. I mean, we I thought we you know deregulated as much as maybe we could back in 1996 when we took away their generation monopoly. But you guys are suggesting we may have a good ways to go and, and get more benefits from pursuing those good ways, right? Well, again, you know, it's like trying Western civilization. Like, let's give this restructuring thing a real shot <laughs> when it comes to residential <laughs> customers. Like, let's really see if this can work for them. Because up until now, it has made them worse off, right? You do worse as a residential customer by migrating out to a competitive supplier. Yeah. Because the, the only competitive suppliers that are interested in you are the bottom feeders. Yeah. The companies like Gritty down in Texas that exposed people nakedly to the wholesale market. The thousands of dollars for a few days of power. Oh, yeah. Like, there's all these bait and switch <laughs> things that happen. Right. You know, there are sleazy efforts to go into poor neighborhoods and deceive people into agreeing to yeah. bad deals with electric suppliers. We we want to we want to we want to make that better yeah. so that residential customers can actually get something out of this. Why? Because they have paid hundreds of millions of dollars for the privilege. They've paid stranded costs that right. have to do with stranded Seabrook, costs. stranded costs stranded with respect costs. to long-term right. power contracts that were bad. That phrase, stranded stranded costs. Costs. It's yeah. like they're stuck in a lifeboat. You have to right. go rescue them because right. their we, utility investments they went bad. That's what we it was. Didn't <laughs> even, we hadn't <laughs> even learned our lesson by 2007 <laughs> when we let. Eversource waste four hundred and twenty-five million dollars putting a scrubber at Merrimack Station. Yeah, lipstick on a pig. They should have, they should have shut the plant down. Instead, they wasted four hundred and twenty-five million bucks on that scrubber. Who is paying that four hundred and twenty-five million dollars? Answer: Ratepayers are paying four hundred million of it, even though we don't have the rights to that plant anymore. Yeah. And most of the time, it's just sitting out there rusting and earning yeah. capacity money for its current owners. Well, it got capacity money in the latest capacity auction. It was yes, paid they did. pretty handsomely to be on standby in case we need to have polluting coal-fired power plants in Merrimack New and yeah, in uh, Bow, New Hampshire, fired up again. So that's another thing. You know, all of that stuff happens because our regional transmission organization, ISO New England, is running our wholesale markets for us. They control the rules. They have this old boys club called Neepool, which is the so-called <laughs> stakeholder advisory group. And all of that happens totally out of the public eye. We really need to reform the way we run and oversee our regional transmission uh, organization. I, I know you're really on that case and you're on their advisory panel of some sort, right? Well, I'm obsessed with this, you know, and I'm really happy to see that the states have finally caught on that we need to do something about the way we oversee our yeah. regional transmission organization. It was a massive transfer of authority from the states, which used to have really plenary authority about what kind of generation we did, we used, and how didn't, we didn't really do it very well, in my opinion. And but we, okay. we deregulated, so we transferred all that authority to these regional transmission organizations that are under the authority of the federal regulators. The federal regulators, uh, I would say, regulate with a pretty light touch, and uh, ISO New England is unaccountable. And they, so they're into doling out free money to uh, Mystic Station north of Boston, the, yeah. big, the biggest generator yeah. in New England. Yeah. They threatened to clo close up shop and go away, and ISO was like, oh, please, let us give you free money. Yeah. So, you know, again, walking back, restructuring, again, yeah. Yeah. putting the risk back on the backs of ratepayers because we're worried about we could be the next Texas. That's my big worry about Texas, is yeah. that anytime anything really bad happens, that becomes an excuse for all the rent seekers to come out of the woodwork and say, <laughs> oh, no, 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 we can't be the next Texas, so we have to spend lots of your money coming out of your wallet, because again, the ratepayers are the only wallet in the room, <laughs> making sure that we don't become the next Texas when it gets cold next winter. Okay. I want to get back to Madeline. Madeline, you, you've, you've done a wonderful job as uh, taking over the New Hampshire Sustainable Energy Association, and it's now Clean Energy New Hampshire, which I think is a wonderful title of, for thing. And uh, what, 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 is, what is your agenda going forward? What are your goals, and how do you plan to get them achieved? Oh, goodness. Um, we don't I have mean, much time, but it's probably an session, hour topic. But This session, we're playing a lot of defense. Like I said, um, you know, energy efficiency, renewable energy, all of the the things we really care about, the, the, the policies we already have, are being proposed to be reduced, rolled back, undermined. And so yeah. right now we're playing a lot of defense. Um, our goal is really to have folks have their energy be more affordable through energy efficiency, 
the and the money that they do have to spend on energy ideally is reinvested locally so when we were talking about biomass for example if you heat your house with a wood pellet stove or a wood pellet boiler there's been analyses that look at 90 percent of what you spend is reinvested within your own state's economy yeah. if you're buying fuel oil only about 20 percent of that stays in the local economy yeah. and so to us that's what's really important probably even I more mean, dramatic we do a lot of education. solar mm -hmm. so we do a lot of education we work with a lot of energy committees we love working with energy committees they're great local energy champions as don mentioned we're seeing a lot of great leadership at the local level be it towns and cities interested in community power interested in doing efficiency projects running weatherized campaigns in their communities, doing solar projects for towns and cities. Um, so we work a lot with folks that, you know, we're there to give them the tools and the resources they need to make their projects happen. That's great, that's great. Well, we're, we're glad you're there and working on this. Um, you know, there's so much we haven't really had time to get into. We, you know, just barely mentioned net metering uh, by the way, Madeline, is there any chance that this time in the legislature you'll get some advancement on net metering limits at the current one megawatt level for cities like Manchester, Nashua, and many others, uh, which, you know, unfortunately, I think we made a mistake in our handling of this last time, and I apologize for that, but is there yeah. any hope there? I think all the stars are aligned, and unless something goes really wrong, we have, as I mentioned, there was a House bill, House Bill 106, that I think unfortunately is going to be retained on Monday. But we have Senate Bill 109, which is sponsored by Senator Avard, and he's very passionate about moving that bill forward. Yeah, he's really And it would on allow that. only projects over a megawatt that serve municipalities and schools and public entities or any subdivision of the government. So it would be limited and targeted expansion of net metering for those public projects. Yeah. And so I'm but my understanding is that the governor's office supports this limited and targeted expansion, okay. and so we're really hoping that that Senate Bill 109 is going to make it through. So, so the, just, the action kind of shifts over to the Senate on all these renewable energy initiatives. Meanwhile, over on the House side, House Bill 2, the budget trailer bill, <laughs> embraces the Bob Backus brilliant idea of creating a New Hampshire Department, Department of Energy. I've been, I've been just trying to read it and understand it. I hope you do. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? What's your quick reaction, Madeline? It's a huge change, but we're excited. I think there's a lot of potential for really positive How about change that? Uh, with that restructuring. A chance to ally with the governor on something. That's pretty exciting. We haven't too many of those, right? Well, folks, this, this hour flies by always, but I can't imagine it's been more quick moving than this, this particular edition of the Progress Report. I want to thank you both for being with us and for what you do every day to advance us to a better energy policy. Energy is so important. It's not just about dollars and cents, it's about our future of our planet and how we're going to live. And uh, it's just uh, real exciting to have people of your caliber serving us. Don, I'm uh, really uh, a great admirer of yours, and, uh, and uh, you're, you're a great writer, too, I must say. Uh, well, thank you. It's a great honor to be here with such distinguished uh, New Hampshire policymakers and with so formidable a uh, energy advocate as Madeline. We got, a, we got a wonderful one there, too, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, it's been, a, it's been a real pleasure. I hope you folks out there enjoyed it. There are many rebroadcasts coming up, and I hope some of you that didn't catch us tonight will catch us on those. And thank you again for coming in, folks. We'll be back with another edition of The Progress next week. I believe next week we're going to have Rennie Cushing on. He's, wow. my, he's, uh, he's, he's, he's one of my heroes. Did you see the letter about him in the Union Leader?